In part 1, I said this series would be divided into three sections. The first section was covered in parts 2 and 3 when I offered an analytical framework for my scripted gaming content, then the second section broke down all my unfinished projects in parts 4 through 7. So now it's time for the third section, which is going to be the most fun. What project am I working on next? I featured three candidates in parts 5 through 7, but for reasons I discussed in those videos, none of them seem like the perfect fit right now. So in this section, I'm going to reveal three additional candidates that I've never talked about before. I said at the end of the last video that I would cover all three ideas in the same episode, but as the video got longer and longer, it eventually made more sense to split them up. Before we get started, allow me to address the obvious. Why am I spending so much time creating this series and talking about hypothetical future video projects when I could spend that same time just working on a new project? I could make a whole video about that topic alone, but that's too far even for me, so I'll give you the short answer. Right off the top, this channel is just a hobby for me, so I don't have to conform to any standardized format or schedule like someone trying to maximize their revenue. But that doesn't mean I don't care about this channel. Quite the opposite, actually. It just means I can make whatever I want. In fact, the only projects I would ever be interested in making are things that bring something unique to the table and could withstand the test of time. I also want my next project in particular to be something special. Something not like what I've made before. It needs to be a viable derivative work that people will actually watch, but also something I'll actually be inspired to make. However, if you know my history, there were some projects in the past I wasn't able to deliver on, so I need to make sure that doesn't happen again. That means once I begin the new one, it's imperative I dedicate myself to it until I see it all the way through to the end. So my next project will be a real commitment, and that's why I need to choose it very carefully. So to answer the question, the purpose of the Shady Paradox Files is twofold. For me, making these videos has offered clarity for where I want to go. Every candidate for my next project is ambitious in its own unique way, so this series is helping me sort through all the confounding factors. For you, it allows you to understand where I'm really coming from, so we can finally be on the same page. As we go over each of the three new candidates, I'll play a small sample of each one. That's the best way to get you up to speed on what I'm really going for. A lot of work is going into these samples, because I can't just jump in and make them. I also have to flesh out broader design work so I know what I'm doing. That's why everything has been taking such a long time to make. But on the bright side, if my next project is one of these three, I'm now a little ahead on starting whichever one I choose. Just like with Project Red Pants, it turns out that I could use some help with these. Fortunately, the biggest issues are mostly one-time affairs involving how to set them up at the start, rather than anything I would need continuous assistance with. Unlike Red Pants, these series are episodic, so this time your help would bear fruit much sooner. I must say, I do like these new projects better than the ones I talked about in prior episodes, and there's an important reason for that. You see, up to this point, every project I've brought up so far is either a Let's Play or a commentary series that closely resembles one. The trouble I run into is that the Let's Play label has a very specific connotation on the internet, typically meaning someone is recording live gameplay with stream of consciousness commentary. But as I've been trying to convey this whole time, none of my projects really are true Let's Plays in the classic sense. Instead, they're different attempts at putting on a show, in which I'm playing a character at least some, if not all of the time. The purpose of the early episodes of this series was to clarify this distinction. However, explanations are not enough. As long as I stay adjacent to the Let's Play label, I don't think it's possible for my work to truly stand out the way I want it to. So the only solution is to get away from the Let's Play genre entirely. While all three candidates do feature my voice accompanying gameplay, each one would take this channel in a completely different direction. None of them are traditional Let's Plays, or even the scripted character plays like I've made in the past. So let's get started. Allow me to introduce the first of the three new project ideas I'm considering. Quern Undying Thoughts is a game released by Zadbox Entertainment on November 28, 2016. The basic premise is that you are being guided through the world of Quern by Professor William Maythorn. Maythorn has discovered that Quern harbors special powers due to its place in the world chain, but he needs to recruit an assistant to help him finish his project. 
so he set up an obstacle course of puzzles across Quern for you, both as a teaching tool and as a test of your worthiness. I really enjoyed this game, and I strongly recommend it if you're a fan of games like Myst and Riven, because the inspiration is obvious. Just like Myst, Quern starts with the silent protagonist being dropped into a surreal, mysterious world under vaguely specified conditions. The lore features parallel worlds reminiscent of the linking books, and even the fact you have unlimited time to solve the puzzles is baked directly into the story. However, that's not to say it's purely a knockoff. To its credit, Quern also expands into a broader range of puzzles than the Myst series typically does. It contains a more comprehensive set of inventory puzzles, as well as a multitude of standalone logic puzzles. In my opinion, this is the game's greatest strength. It also does a good job inviting exploration and creating an open world feel. Multiple obstacles are usually present at any given time, and you will often need to revisit previously explored areas as new puzzle vectors open up within them. However, this open world is also kind of an illusion because ultimately there's not a lot of flexibility as to the order in which the puzzles need to be solved. Each of my three project ideas features a different game, and of those three games, this is the only one in which I would consider also making a classic character playthrough series as I did with Myst and Myst 3. That's in addition to the main idea I have for this game, it's not the main idea itself. Anyway, if I did, it would probably feel very similar to my old Myst 3 Exile playthrough because of the familiar mood set in the game. The trouble I would run into, though, is that it is a very long game. And while the story is underrated in my opinion, it is relatively simple. So I am concerned about possible dry spells in the series that could last for multiple videos at a time. I may not always have enough material to keep my content as engaging as I would like for the entire duration. One minor gripe I have with the game is that some of the puzzles reset after saving and loading. I think they were trying to protect players from messing up those logic puzzles too badly while trying to solve them. But I would argue this also hurts players just as much. If the puzzles always reset, then players can't save their intermediate progress either. I bring this up because in my case, resetting the puzzles violates continuity between recording sessions, and in so doing it messes up a small part of the immersion. But like I just told you, a regular playthrough isn't what I have my eyes set on anymore. As you saw on the screen earlier, what I'm really looking into for this game is making a series that currently has the working title Quern Studies. As the title implies, this series would assume an academic persona. Rather than covering the whole game, it would exclusively focus on tackling the most difficult logic puzzles. Some people might describe these puzzles as being math heavy, but I don't think they're out of anyone's league. Most players are able to work them out, or at least stumble through them eventually. Still, these puzzles can be quite frustrating, and even once players do solve them, they may not always fully understand what they did, or more importantly, remember how to replicate it. Furthermore, I've found online walkthroughs rather wanting in their solutions for these. They usually either give only a direct set of instructions, or they won't say anything at all and just leave players to solve them on their own. In other words, while some of them might show the how, none of them show the why. This is where I see a unique opportunity. I want to create a reliable resource that will provide a complete solution and explanation for these puzzles. But I'd like to deep dive a bit more than that too, because it's high time I finally make something out of my mathematics degree. N no, but seriously, I often discover extra things about these puzzles that I find more interesting than the mere answer. What exactly I'd cover would depend on the puzzle I'm looking at. I might provide a neat trick or a rule of thumb that's easy to remember. I might formally prove only one unique solution exists. I might optimize the fastest solution for speedrunners. Or perhaps I'd experiment with different versions of the puzzle by changing the parameters, and develop a theory about that whole type of puzzle in the process. Whatever purpose each video takes on, the goal would be to explain the concepts in a digestible way that most people can understand and hopefully appreciate. I'll play the sample so you can get the idea. The sliding blocks puzzle at the start of the game is simpler than the puzzles later on, but it will still give you a good sense of what I'm going for here. Apologies for the minor spoilers, but there's no way around that. In order to make the explanations clearer, I'm currently learning how to program mathematical animations using Manim. Manim is a Python library that was originally created by the popular YouTuber 3 blue one Brown for this purpose. I wish I had this back when I analyzed the Wheels of Wonder in Myst 3. 
I also put SimCity 4 music in instead of the Quern soundtrack, because swapping the music helps the series stand out against ordinary playthroughs, and this style seems to set the right mood. This is just a draft for a video that doesn't exist yet, so I reserve the right to make any changes between now and when I publish the actual episode. With that disclaimer in mind, here it is. So let's take a close look at how the sliding blocks puzzle really works. To briefly refresh on the rules, the goal of this puzzle is to maneuver the metal block past the concrete blocks up to the opposite corner, where it'll be in position to slide out and serve as the door's counterweight. The pieces generally all move the same way, however only the metal block is small enough to exit through the opening, so the puzzle gives you just two empty spaces to work with throughout. Now let's look at how to solve it. If we just start moving pieces around without a plan, we may eventually get there but we're not likely to learn anything interesting. Instead, let's focus on the bigger picture by removing distractions that make it harder to see. Suppose there weren't any one square blocks at all, and all we had to navigate were the three larger blocks that take two squares. Sure, this puzzle would be a lot easier, but finding solutions here isn't the point. Although there are fewer constraints in this version, any constraints we do encounter here will certainly apply to the main puzzle as well, so the purpose of this exercise is to sniff those constraints out. One such constraint becomes immediately apparent. Notice that even in this relatively open field, it's still impossible for the target block to pass between the other two blocks, even if we move those blocks as far apart from each other as possible. In fact, this is true of all three blocks. No large block can ever pass between the other two no matter what we do. Therefore, if we label each of these blocks to track their relative positions, we can observe that they will always maintain the same rotational order, in other words, you'll never be able to count them in this order. Anyway, because of this constraint, the only way forward is to try to rotate these blocks around the board, either clockwise or counterclockwise. It turns out there are solutions in the main puzzle that go in both directions. Here's the critical thing though. In either case, sooner or later you're going to have to find a way to get the vertical block to pass across the midline to the left half of the grid. I'm not just saying this is a good idea, I'm saying as long as you don't, it will be literally impossible for you to get the target block to its goal. It's easy to see why this is the case when going counterclockwise, since the vertical block just gets in the way of the target block's upward movement. In the case of going clockwise, the target block trails behind the other horizontal block in the rotational order. So this time the vertical block must cross the midline in order to make room for both horizontal blocks to occupy the right hand side. So the bottom line is, the vertical block must cross over no matter what. Now, this move across the midline is not easy to accomplish. In fact, though it may not be obvious at first, it's the most critical move in solving the entire puzzle. This is because this move can only be done under very precise conditions in the main puzzle. First of all, in order for this block to move horizontally at all, it must use both empty spaces of course. While that is true anywhere on the board, at least in other cases there's some flexibility as to where the other big blocks have to be at the time. However, in the case of the midline, it now requires both horizontal blocks to take up the entire third row, because there's no room for them anywhere else that keeps them outside the red square. Notice too that in this moment we only have four spaces left to be accounted for. Remember, the main puzzle needs four one square blocks, so that's where they have to go. This means every piece of the puzzle must be arranged in this exact position at some point in your solution in order for this critical move to ever take place. Therefore, this position is what you should actually work on as your main goal of this puzzle. That leads to smaller goals along the way. First you join the two horizontal blocks together, then split the smaller blocks up in pairs. And all the meanwhile, don't ever let your two empty spaces become separated. Then once you get to this position, moving the target block to the exit should be pretty straightforward. The only flexibility you have with this setup is which blocks are on top depending on whether you went clockwise or counterclockwise. Actually, the counterclockwise solution will look like this because of the rotation order. Anyway, that should be enough analysis to get at the spirit of the puzzle. The other moves just round out the details of attaining those goals. What you're looking at here is what I'm pretty sure is the fastest solution, taking only 29 moves to get the metal block into position. However, I do not actually recommend this solution for speedrunners because there's a better way that helps them later in the game.
There you go, I've already got a great head start making the first episode because of that. The full episode will finish off the explanation by optimizing the speedrun. As I said, this puzzle is pretty simple compared to the later ones, but I look forward to the challenge the later ones present. In fact, the puzzle I'm most eager to break down is probably the most complex one in the game, which is a slightly modified version of the board game called Mastermind. I programmed a brute force solver for it in 2019, and so I already understand it on a pretty high level. Even if I end up not making any other content for Quern, I would still like to make a video at least analyzing Mastermind, because I discovered a lot of interesting things about it that would make a really neat video. On the other extreme, I could make all the Quern Studies episodes and a full commentary playthrough alongside it. Right now I'm leaning toward not doing that though, and just concentrating my effort on the most original content. The scripts for Corn Studies may change depending on whether it was accompanied by a full playthrough or not, so I'll have to decide this soon. Or should I do anything with Quern at all? As with all the other projects I've looked at in the Shady Paradox files, I should carefully weigh the arguments to determine whether this project truly is worth my time. This evaluation applies to Quern Studies in particular since that's the unique idea for this game that everything else pivots around. So right off the bat, that's the first thing that should be listed in the positive column. The idea of a mathematics lecture series may not appeal to everyone on the surface, but if I do a good job with it, I think a lot of people would be surprised at how engaging they'd find it. And in so doing, the series would fill a knowledge gap that currently exists for this game. Not only would this provide a handy resource for anyone who wanted to master the harder puzzles, but it would also provide proofs for optimal speedruns. Another thing I like about Quern is the mood it entails. The other two project candidates will have a more humorous tone, so this would set a good contrast if I end up doing more than one of these. Those games are also a bit older than this one, as are the games I've featured in the past on this channel, so this project would introduce a more modern element into the balance. It's not the newest game out there by any stretch, but it's enough to offer a nice contrast. Unfortunately, it is old enough to where I know it's not exactly the highest trending game anymore either. Although a handful of my followers have requested I cover this game in one form or another, I can't be confident what the true demand actually is. The worst thing that could happen is that I get hung up on this project if the demand does turn out to be low, since the production for it is not going to be easy. I would need a lot of time to program the Manim videos, and if I do the full playthrough, I might be tempted to overdo the video editing in order to overcome the resetting puzzles. And let's be honest, not everyone enjoys math as much as I do. All things considered though, the positives outweigh the negatives. I said in the opening section that I could use some help from a volunteer or two. For this one, I would greatly appreciate any mathematicians out there willing to review my content before I publish it, just to ensure my explanations cover everything they should and don't have any holes in the logic. I should be able to program the animations myself, but if anyone with better coding experience could answer a few higher level programming questions, I'd greatly benefit from some minor consultation. So there are a couple small things I'd like some help with to ensure this goes swimmingly. But there's nothing prohibitive here, so I could start on this project immediately. Although making these expositions would be challenging, the whole series would only be about 6 episodes, so it's certainly doable, and is definitely something I want to look more into. So that's the first of my three new project candidates. Let me know what you think about it. The other two candidates are fairly similar to one another, so I still plan to cover both of them together in the next video. See you in part 9!